when when did you go into when did you did you enlist or were you drafted drafted okay and what year 1942 okay and then did they send you to england were you in england a long time before the invasion uh no no i took basic training um I was shipped to Florida, and from Florida they fifth the ship me to Wichita Falls, Texas, for my basic training. That's learned to, to march and to, to drill. And back to Florida again for advanced tra training, and uh, then uh, that was for uh, preparation to more or less to see what I was qualified for. So then they shipped me back to Texas again, to Wichita Falls, Falls again to take training on uh, the airships. Mm -hmm. We trained on 26s, B-26, B-25s. B-25s and 24s, I, I got a lot of similarity, except the size. And uh, they're two planes easy to fly. So we trained on uh, more or less the uh, operation of uh, B-25s they familiarize ourselves with the fuselage and the controls and uh, along with the uh, dash it's about the same mm -hmm. and then we, they uh, had shipped me back down to to florida again to complete my training take gunnery training okay and after i've completed gunnery training they back up to to um fort worth texas and I, we went to school there, and then we graduated from there from Buck Sergeants, all of us. And from there we was, uh, went to uh, where we formed a cruise. Um, Anyhow, I'll remember the state after a while. Right. Um, they formed a cruise. So we, we met in one room, and uh, I didn't like the noise, and I sat down at the other end of the room. I was a buck sergeant. Pretty soon, two men came over and uh, introduced themselves, and one was a tail gunner and one was a waist gunner, Sergeant Burke and Sergeant Black. And we sat, chatted a little bit. Pretty soon, another man, he had been over there, he came up and introduced himself, and he was a ball turret gunner, Sergeant Metcalf. And we chatted a little bit, and pretty soon, another man came over, and he was in South. And I'm having a trouble remembering his name because it was a funny name, but he was from the Deep South, and he came from the Southern Country, uh, one of the states. He was a sawmill operator, and uh, that's where they made trees into lumber. And that made us, and then we didn't, we had a full crew of five men, and we needed one and more men, and uh, later on in the day, two lieutenant, first or second lieutenants walked up to us. One was a, a, a military, striking military man, the pilot. He was from Ohio, he seen you Ohio. Mm -hmm. He introduced himself, and the, the co-pilot was from Bronx, New York, short and heavy set, and he smoked a pipe, but never lit. He, he jiggled <laughs> up and down. And uh, they were Mutt and Jeff, like this. Uh -huh. So I introduced, uh, he asked me who's, who's in charge. I said, well, since I was a top torque gunner, that article made me mad. That's the way it was set up. That article made me mad. I was in charge of the rest of the soldiers. Okay. So he asked me to introduce I sent each man. I introduced him. And he said, well, all, all we need is a radio operator. And I said, right. Well, he picked a radio operator, and he didn't quite fit in. Uh, he was a big man, and uh, he liked self. Mm. So... Uh, anyhow, we didn't object, didn't say much about it. But I had, anyhow, as we progressed, he just never fit in with the rest of the five. 
So we were supposed to go to Wendover Field, Utah, to uh, perform flying and get used to each other. And we was down to, to Utah, but it was windy and we were going to stay in tents with a wooden floor. And he didn't like that, the pilot didn't like that. So he uh, loaned us all money, uh, enough to get home, and he paid her ways, and we could pay back, because uh, enlisted men were broke. Right. <laughs> $50 a month, that was not much money. And we all came home, and uh, I met this lady here, and I was on a vacation, and then when it went back, and we'd go back up to Wendover Field, Utah, or free form, but they didn't. He sent us to Tonopah, Nevada, okay. and that's where we trained together. And I, in my course of flying, I was stood between the pilot and co-pilot on takeoff, called out at uh, the airspeed to the pilot. When that was done, we was airborne, then I was free to roam the ship. And I flew all positions uh, in training exercises except ball turret, and I wouldn't get in one of those. <laughs> and we on the uh, pilot, co-pilot, radio operator Matt Devine, and then the 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 uh, bombardier, and I can't tell you his name. He had been at Pearl Harbor, and as enlisted man, and came back and took officer's training became our co-pilot. Okay. He was automatically the bombardier, but he's also a gunner. See, the ships had one of twin 50s for the man in the nose. Okay. So we flipped the tone to Paul Nevada and flew there for, I think it was uh, 60 days, five days a week. Um, we practiced takeoffs and, uh, and the navigator, he got to navigate. We was in many different states. And one of them was a thrill. Uh, when we went down in the Grand Canyon of Colorado, mm. we flew down in. Mm. Wow. He looked up and saw the rim. That's the type of pilot I had. Right. He could fly a plane, and he knew it. The co-pilot, well, <laughs> he wasn't that good. But hey, we got down in there. And uh, we was flying down, following it long, and uh, was coming through and we rounded a curve. There was a dam right in front of us. <laughs> and we were below the dam. Oh my goodness. You ever hear engines scream? <laughs> they will scream then. And we cleared it <coughs> not too many feet above the cables. And uh, then when we got across it, we. Um, we visited that Boulder City, Colorado, Boulder, uh -huh. and uh, we sat down on the water because on our tail, the tail uh, had the uh, markings on it that just told the, the Army where we were stationed and what crew we were. Mm -hmm. you know, the tail assembly was marked that way. and But we stayed on the water till we got s certain heights and then we pulled up and come home. <laughs> And uh, because it would have been court-martialed oh. if they found out. And so we, we kept mum about that. But we, we flew in many states on the training missions for the bombardier, training missions for the navigator, and just plain training missions for pilot and co-pilot. And that included me. And uh, we've been down low enough, we chased horses, we chased cattle, and uh, I had a pilot that could fly. You know what I mean. He, I guess. He was good. And uh, one other time we rounded a corner like that, and there was a house sitting there, a little cottage, a uh, haystack on this side, haystack on the right-hand side, five people on the floor, on the, t uh, the porch. I was sitting in the nose, and when he came re rounded the corner, the five people disappeared. So did the right haystack. <laughs> 
but we made it through. We had hay on all over the plane for a while. Oh my goodness. That we was that low. And that was about the last one that we we uh, we enjoyed the ride. After that, uh, the orders got back to the commander to uh, so many, fly so many feet above the ground, so we we buried that. But we banded together and they shipped us to California, and we stayed at Fielded, California, while Sacramento, California, for I think I believe a week, and then they flew us. We flew to what a place called Nuts Corner or no, Goose Bay Laboratory. And uh, Goose Bay Laboratory, we were banded together with another group, the enlisted men did, and they put 12 of us, 10 of us, with uh, two officers and flew us across the waters. Mm -hmm. And we landed in, in, in um, England on February the 2nd, 1940. No, 1942. 42. 42. Or 41. 42. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they, it was at a place called Horsham St. Faith was the name of the field. And it was, it was a, a fence between it, a barbed wire fence between us and the town and the fence was down. Mm -hmm. But then there was the city that we were stationed at, it was heavily bombed with buzz bombs. Mm -hmm. And you could hear those things coming over at night. But in daytime, we didn't know where or where, what or they were coming from. And it was, they were coming from Ham, Germany, just across the waters. And they would fly across us, you could hear them they called putt putts, and pretty soon that engine would quit and the bomb would drop. Mm. Norwich was the name of the city. It was heavily bombed, and uh, then we flew and walked all over the northern part of England to acquaint ourselves with the lay of the land. And I was the first engineer, that, so there was only. Crew of the crew and myself, five men, that did the flying. The other men stayed down on the ground. But then on, see, it was January. January. Forty-three. Twenty-seventh. Twenty-seventh of January. Another. They had another. Uh, airplane crew or force on the same field we were there was smaller mm -hmm. but on January the 20 February the 27th 43 that we pulled our first flight and it more or less was conversionary flight we flew over the waters but not into t enemy territory we flew close mm -hmm. trying to draw them out but they had to do off we wouldn't come out and uh, the second day we did the same thing, except we were almost in Germany. All we had to do was go over to the right a little bit. We were in Germany. And they didn't send any fighters up. So we waited a week. And uh, then they, they called us. I was crew 47. And they called us and... and and because and, and the first time we we had ever taken off with a load, a B-17 is what to use in the beginning. It was a small ship, only had one bomb bay. They could only carry so much load, and a B-24 could double the load, and flew it fly, We flew at faster speed, so we had loaded down. The first bombing ratio we pulled we loaded down had. 26 200 pound bombs on. And uh, the first mission we pulled, we had bombed a submarine pen. So we left 28,500 feet to come down to 10. 
and skip bombed bombs on the water. They had fins in them so he could the bombardier could straighten them out. And uh, we were successful in that. Of course, I'm talking about, I suppose, 30 ships went in on that. See, we'd fly here, two here, one down here. Mm -hmm. That was just one outfit. And there was many planes as you could see. For miles you could see, they were landed in black dots. We had that many planes in the air. We bombed that one, bombed the next one was a railroad station, a large railroad station, and we bombed that. We did not bomb any people, nor any city. And we were designated to fly over north, south, east, and west of Germany. We never left Germany. All we were interested in was where they had stored their supplies, mm -hmm. such as gasoline and supplies for the Army. Army travels on the stomach. You cut off the supplies, the Army ceased to be exist. So we flew 15 missions every other day. And uh, we got over the 13th, everybody was superstitious about 13. I'm not superstitious. And the crew wasn't superstitious. We threw 13, we didn't call it A, B, or 12A, but we just 13, that was enough to come in. And uh, on the fifth, 16th mission we had made, we were uh, pretty hardened to it. Because when you went out on a mission, you didn't know whether you were coming back or not. And uh, we were sort of hardened, and they brought in a, a new bunch of second lieutenants and crews uh, to supply the ones who were missing. And we had, I think, five crews come in that was missing from our outfit. And they replaced them and replaced the ships. I don't know how many ships is on the field. They wouldn't tell us and they wouldn't allow us to count them. But uh, we flew together as a crew from beginning and to end. We never had a, much of a casualty for any man to get hurt. I was the only one really got hurt. And uh, that was sort of a freak accident. And. Uh, but none of us was hurt, none of us was shot. And we flew together, stayed together for 30 missions. I had an operation for tonsils to take it out. And that was it. Later on, they, they called the crew to fly to, to Baum Ham, where they, they, they made all those buzz bombs. And I had had one of my tonsils taken out so I couldn't fly. And the radio operator was sick that day, he couldn't fly. So we stayed home and they went into, in all things, they flew out in the afternoon. And uh, we were down on the airfield. We was good enough to walk down to the part on the airfield. And they flew in in the evening. Well, the Luftwaffe boys come in because we had to turn on our landing lights. Oh. And they would come right in among the ships. And they blowed two or three ships up right over the airfield. And my pilot told me when he heard her guns rattle, he'd shut off all lights and headed for the sea. There's enough lit light there he could see out, out to the sea. Mm -hmm. He headed for the channel. So he came back in, he was safe. So we didn't fly any more nighttime flimes there. 458th bomb group didn't fly them. And we finished our tour duty. They did, the pilot and co-pilot, navigator and bombardier did 31 missions. So two of us and the rest of the crew could, so could do and have 31, 30 missions. That would qualify us to come home. Right. Um, so on the 30th mission, when we landed there, they immediately separated all of us. I went one direction, the pilot and co-pilot went another, the bombardier and, and the navigator went another. The, uh, they had separate uh, 
men to come pick us up, the MPs to pick us up. I, they took me up to my barracks and told me to load up my clothes. I put them all in a barracks bag and, and uh, except the uniform I had on. And they shipped me to a Quonset hut. I never saw my crew after that, no, none of them, until we arrived at Florida. And they took me over to Quonset hut and they had 18 men. I made the 18th man. They told us we was going down south of the Pacific on the B-1B bomber. And we didn't know anything about it. Right. So we stayed there for 18 days, I think. It's either 15 or 18 days. The final day, they came in and, and told us that we were no longer going to have to fly anywhere. We were going home. So they held us for two days there. Told us to get all over here together, and uh, they had taken away all ODs from us. Mm -hmm. They gave us all khaki, and so we come home on a, a large ship, the Louis Pasteur. Is the name of the ship? The largest ship that uh, that uh, passenger ship that was on the waters. We came home, and we had approximately fifteen hundred Jerry's. That's what we call them prisoners of war, PWs, in the hold. And I don't know how many enlisted men. We were on the second flight. The top deck was the officers. And my crew came back on it. The officers did, the four officers. And the rest of the crew of us was on the ship on the second deck. And being a first three grader, it was my duty to take the soldiers out from the hold in the evening and give them walking around on the deck, mm -hmm. give them a breath of fresh air. <laughs> well, the amusing thing about it, uh, they were um, SS officers, the kind, mm -hmm. the kind that they were, they were something else. And it's our duty to walk around. I, I paid somebody else to walk my man. I, and when I was on called on duty. But the thing about it, they never they never made it here. The FSS officers did not make it. We gave them a free bath. I wasn't one of them. Right. I paid somebody else to pull my duty, so I wouldn't be guilty of that. And it was nosed abroad of the soldiers there that no SS officer would come back to the United States. Hmm. Um, but the other men that was in the hold, and I talked to a lot of them. Um, the main theme that was down, what would you do if you was 20 years old or younger, if they'd ask you to join the Army and you refused? And their answer was, we didn't refuse. Mm -hmm. If you refused, you were dead. So they were, was in the army. It was not by choice. Right. And the men they brought back, when we landed in New York City, they took them one way and we went the other way. I don't know what they did with them, uh, how they were, was maybe let loose here. I don't know anything about them. But I, we landed in New York City. We stayed there four days and then we started um, I was put on a plane, on a train, and I came home for seven days on a furlough. Mm -hmm. uh, Did I miss anything? I think it was 43 instead of 42 because you, you were over there, did your 30 missions, and then came home in 44. I did pull 30 missions. There was uh, two of us. They flew 31 missions, so we could have 30 missions were qualified to come home. Right. Uh, the radio operator and myself, he was sick and I was sick on the same day. Um, so that was the story. I came home 
and uh, <laughs> should I say the rest? September. In September. Mm -hmm. and, and home was where? Was home Newark? Mm -mm. Newark. Logan, no. Logan, Ohio. Uh, Newark, Ohio. Okay. No, Logan, Ohio. Logan, Ohio. Okay. And uh, my memory's a little bit, and, and uh, I came home, and uh, on a first furlough. Shall I tell him the rest? Well, I don't know. What are you going to tell him? That was when I met you. I landed on no, Saturday. No, honey, you didn't meet us. Oh, you came Second to furlough. Us. He came to Columbus to get me. Well, I landed in Logan, mm -hmm. and I, on a Saturday, I found out where she was, and uh, I happened to meet a man when I was in the first grade. He and I remained friends, and uh, I saw him across the a place. He was trying to buy gasoline. You couldn't buy gasoline unless you had ration stamps. Right. Well, I had a pocket full of ration stamps, <laughs> and I walked over and told him his name was Don Skinner, and I walked over to him, and I said, I asked him what the trouble was. He said, I can't buy gasoline, and I need gasoline to get home. He lived at Union Furnace, and I said, well, if we can solve that problem, I gave him ration stamps, if you'll take me to Columbus, <laughs> and he said he would, and he said, when? I said, on Monday, so when... Uh, Monday came, Don was there, and uh, he took me to Columbus. I'd found out where she was and I was where she worked. Okay. So I went to Columbus you. where she worked, walked into where she worked, and asked for her by her name. He said, yes, he, she's here. He called her up, and uh, I looked at it, and I said, you're going home. And, I oh, I didn't know I that. So she says, wait till I get my tools. I said, just forget the tools. We're going home. And we stopped at the place we roomed and picked her clothes up. I told her to get all the clothes she had there. She didn't catch on. <laughs> and so she got her clothes and left the rooming house. And we talked as we went back down to Logan. And uh, I left there and went down to my mother's house had got cleaned up, and I came back up in the evening, and uh, we didn't have any car. We walked wherever we went. Logan's not very big anyway. Right. Not very big, about three-quarters of a mile between us. And walked back up, and uh, we went out to lunch, uh -huh. dinner, rather. Uh -huh. And uh, then we went down to my mother's house and stayed there a little while. And so that's when I asked her, We had one date. He was home <laughs> before he went overseas, right. and uh, we we met. We had known each other, but not not real well, you know. But I knew then that I told his sister. I said I'd have gone with him if he'd asked me, but he didn't want any ties. Right. And, uh, so he came home on, or he came after me on Monday. We were married on Friday. Seventy years. I proposed ago. to her on Monday. <laughs> And we married on Friday, she accepted and was married on Friday. Well, something worked out, huh? <laughs> well, I knew before I went overseas about her. Mm -hmm. I never told her because no, I didn't know whether I was coming back or not. Right. And I never wrote her a love letter or let her even know how I felt because I was unsure until I got into the States than I knew. So when I got a, flew, uh, down there and they let me out at uh, in Logan, uh, I, as far as I was concerned, uh, I was going to propose to her. I was going to ask her to marry me. And I did, and she consented. She's 17. And we had a, a little time with her talking her mom in. Uh, she was close to 18. Right. Yeah. And... Uh, her mom said yes, she finally consented, and we were married. We were took a vacation together uh, on a place where I was raised. We spent two weeks on the farm, 
And uh, Fill in the silo, that's... <laughs> build silo, walking out in the cornfield, opening up watermelons in the cornfield and eating the heart out of them. Uh, it was a, it was a, a beautiful honeymoon to spend uh -huh. just as we, they let the people, uh, with, with where we stayed, to have the run of the house, the run of the field. If I wanted to work, I could, I didn't want to work, I could have. Right. And we just enjoyed ourselves. I taught her how to, to ride two enormous 1,800 horses, 1,800 pound horses. I rode one, she rode her. We rode all over through the country where I was raised. Do and, you uh, know anything about the Cuyahoga Hills? Yes. Well, you know they go up and down this way. Well, the horses had to dig their way up and hold their feet down <laughs> and coming down. And I had, I didn't ride horses before On the small but, banks. But, they were straight, almost straight up and right. straight down. Anyhow, we had two beautiful weekends, or weeks. And then we went to Florida. And then we got acquainted with another couple. They were driving through to Florida, so we stayed, went with them. And uh, when we got, uh, mm. um. what, what happened then? When we went to Florida. Well, we we were in the the uh, motel and nobody was swimming, and uh, I can't even think of the Patrician Hotel, but I can't think where we were, right on the coast, and uh, no one was swimming in the swimming area, and the wind was blowing and everything, so we took a walk, and uh, um, we were walking around. Well, there was not many people on the street, and the trees were bending over like that. It was uh, hurricane time. Oh, we went to Florida on a vacation. Patrician Hotel. Yeah, yeah. that's where we went when you were to go to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we went down, down there, and we went to Florida and Patrician Hotel, and we couldn't understand it. Nobody was on the beach. Uh, Everything was sort of closed down, a lot of wind, and uh, we got on our bathing suits and <laughs> went down on the beach, and we swam in the ocean. And they made us come in. And uh, uh, it was hard swimming. The water wanted to take you out. Uh-huh. So we had a good swim, and we got out. And they made us come out of hmm? the water. Yeah, they made us come out. And we were... They told us there's a hurricane. That's why everybody was up. We, oh, we, a couple of dummies, we didn't know anything well, about it. Never and they one. told us also sharks was coming in close to the shore. So we well, were, we didn't go swimming anymore. <laughs> we were in the hotel for three days uh, eating K rations and so forth, then went to Biloxi, Mississippi. We couldn't even go down to Mess Hall. Were you uh, Biloxi, Mississippi? What did you do there? You were. Uh, the Biloxi, Mississippi, they shipped us to Biloxi, Mississippi, and uh, when I got down there, they made me an instructor, and uh, I taught aircraft engines to, I don't know how many men, and we'd teach for 45 minutes, to be off a half hour, teach for 45 minutes, you talk for 45 minutes, you was mm -hmm. teaching, and you'd be half off a half an hour. And being a first three grader, um, I had to pull extra duty, and that was march the men from the training station to the mess hall. And uh, at first we got rookies, and uh, they were pretty well trained, and then we got men, foot soldiers that had been in the army, some of them had been under fire, or returnees. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to teach them aircraft engines, and we learned a lesson, just leave them alone. So they come in, they, some would stand, and uh, after standing a little while, they'd all be down on the floor, some sleeping, and uh, you don't teach foot soldiers of an under fire much. But we didn't what to, they didn't know what to do with them. Right. So they sent them to school. And they never gave us any trouble, they never got any back talk, and they was, Rugged men in that, a whole lot bigger than physically than I was, but they was always polite, always nice, no no trouble, except when they went to a mess hall, and I was in charge of the 
taking the men down, and I had 48 men, four wide, 12 deep. Mm -hmm. And we had a few of them that wanted to be first into the chow line, and they would do their best to crowd in there, and we finally caught on to who they were. There was three of them, and they wanted to be first in the chow line, so we automatically put them at the end of the line to teach them a lesson. Right. And uh, they never gave us any trouble. We called them to attention. They assembled themselves, never to any trouble, marching down to Chow Hall, and we designate which line would uh, in first. And, and when they come out of the, the mess uh, sergeant, well, the mess, mess hall and finished their dinner, they'd sit outside and uh, in a group, and then you would realign them, and then another um, man would take charge of them and march them to their quarters. We were free from them to go, because to go home, we lived off base. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. You didn't say anything about D-Day, no. being a no. over D-Day. Well, we'll go back and retrace D-Day. Right. That was, uh, that's experience that I can still see. I uh, I don't dream about it, but there are times that I could see what happened on D-Day. Of course, I only could see them maybe, I'd say, in not over 25 minutes or 25 seconds. We flying across the channel, and uh, I'll go back and tell you about that. Anyhow, she went with me and where I was down there, stationed down there. On D-Day, they got, uh, our crew was called out the, about the fourth flight of ships. They knew weather was coming in, bad weather. And they knew there would be heavy rain, a lot of fog. And they got us together and told us we would be to be assembled at a certain height and temp that we come down low and flew over the fly over the channel and try to say underneath the clouds as the foreman. And we was, our mission was to bomb ahead of the troops. Well, on that day we flew and I got I was inquisitive even when he flew across the channel, I opened the bomb bay doors about that wide where I could see. Mm -hmm. It only lasted, I say uh, half a minute, if that. And we were flying about uh, 9,000 feet at that time. And we were going in low and then after, across the channel we had automatically picked up the height was supposed to fly. But during that time I got a, could see down through the bomb bays and uh, I had a, a pair of binoculars, high powered mark binoculars which I got to see, I got to see the ships fire, and I could see the bullets. They they would look that big around. Mm -hmm. They would fly slow, but they go from the battleships. I got to see that landing craft going in, and unloading the plan. Soldiers getting off the the landing craft. Some of them had too much of a load, never come to the top again. They drowned. I presumed. I could see some of them swimming. I could see men as they crossed the beach. Some of them laying there motionless. They were shot. And some of the men was moving in. And I got to see men start to climb the banks. And then things ended for me because I was flying over. But I got to see that for about, I'd say, maybe 20, or maybe 20 seconds or maybe a little more. Well, but that memory has stayed with me. His half-brother was it? There. I have been in 30 battles and I expended my share of machine gun bullets shooting at the enemy, but I, it, it got me, it stayed with me. Some of those didn't have, men didn't have a ghost of a chance. They had too much armament and they got off the landing craft and they drowned. And I could see that. Some of the men 
unloaded some of their equipment and they made it to shore. I got to see men in that panoramic view, a man being shot. And the last view I got to see them, some of them had started to climb the mountain. It was steep. But I couldn't then get to see the top of it. The, the uh, it fog had closed in too tight. And we had to go, I don't, I don't remember how high to get above the fog. And we couldn't see the enemies, we couldn't see our soldiers. And we were supposed to bomb two miles ahead of them. And the, the main ship was called a PFF shoe. It, it, flight, it could see through the fog, the only ship that could see through the fog. And we could bomb on it, dropped its bombs, we were to drop our bombs. Well, first it was five miles in, we were supposed to drop bombs, but we didn't. They advanced the time that we had flew in, they were already five miles ahead of us. And the first bunch of soldiers that got there. So we bombed, we bombed about, I'd say 10 miles ahead of them on the PFF jump. And then we had the Luftwaffe we tried to, to get, pick us up. And on a return trip, they come in on and got some of our men and uh, shot us up on a return trip. We lost some, a few ships, I think, three or four ships on that journey. And uh, we landed, and then we got the news what it was a D-Day. We didn't know why all the ships was there. We were told, wasn't told about D-Day. And uh, that was a mem memory that I have. We went through all of that and came and uh, lived our life through in Logan and uh, through being in church we landed here. That was a long time after I got acquainted then with a man by the name of Bill Gale. Mm -hmm. You've interviewed him. No, no not yet. I'm tomorrow. He is uh, one of what went through and he showed us the movie it is his, at his place where we stayed. His savings of... Private uh, Ryan. Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. Private Ryan. He the first five minutes of that film, <coughs> is, it's authentic. Mm -hmm. And Bill's told us that he went through that. And I think he was the only man of his outfit. I don't remember. I'm not sure, I won't say for sure. No. But only I would say only a few of his outfit came out alive, and he was one of them. He's quite a fellow. He's uh, 90, he's 92? He's, um, no, a year younger than me. Oh. No, two years. Yes, Dad's 94. Okay. Now he's 93 92. and I'm 94. 92, now I'm 94. His wife passed away a couple of years ago. And. Uh, We had got together and went through the saving of Prime, Private Ryan, and he, he pointed him out. He said, the first five minutes of that is authentic. Mm -hmm. That was really what happened. Of course, the rest of it was made up. Right. And we sat and talked about it, him and his wife. Another couple was with us. I don't remember, but I never heard anything uh, till Bill Gale and Dad well, until that Private Ryan came, he never really talked much about. Uh, no, service. you never. We didn't. You know, uh, it, we didn't share expenditures. I wouldn't talk things, about it. You know, but not much about the service. She knew I was a fly boy, yeah, and I flew my d tour duty, and that's about all I told her. And we come home, right? And uh, we got married, and you. He did. You did have an accident there in in uh, England. That's how you got your leg hurt. Well, it, it, that was that accident. I got hurt in the service. We're not going into that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I got both knees. Wasn't a plane um, wreck, though. Right. That, um, I, I got hurt, so I was pulled out, given a rest. Uh, I didn't turn it in. If I'd turned it in, I wouldn't flew them no more. Oh. Okay, if I kept my mouth shut and suffered the pain. Mm -hmm. And on the day that we, I was to be discharged, they lined us up, and of course, I walked with a limp. And uh, through the line as we were moving through, uh, two second lieutenants uh, was uh, from the medical division and I limped as I was walking down through there. And uh, the pilot asked me why I was limped. I wouldn't tell him because I knew what would happen. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to stay with the crew. I didn't want to be a makeup crew. So I, I was just, so just forget it. I twisted me a little, a little bit. And uh, that was a, a, the story. And they picked me out and asked me what was wrong. I told them what was wrong. And they said, why didn't you report it? And I asked, I said, can I ask you a question, sir? Yes. What would you do? Stay with the crew or report it and be discharged? And they looked at me a little bit and said, move on. Yeah. They disqualified me uh, there because we were coming home. Mm -hmm. And I don't know it. And uh, so I came home. And when did you get discharged? Hmm? When did you get out of the service? What year? 44. 44. 45. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of your company. I served home. two, three years, 11 months, and 16 days. Okay. Got discharged in 40, 45 in the... Oh. And I uh, got a uh, day. At Bullock. I wasn't full four years. I lacked 14 days being full years. And that's the, long, that's the longest that we've been apart. She came home with child, and I had to go down from where I was stationed in, in Florida, or no. no Biloxi. Biloxi. And they shipped me back to the original field down in Florida to be discharged. I had to go to Florida, and I went back to Texas again to get, I didn't understand all of what I was <laughs> that. I finally got to come home. And they said, you're going home. Give me enough money to go home on a train. Mm -hmm. And I took a train through, straight through, and landed in Logan. Long journey. I'll bet. Long journey. I'll bet.